I'm really happy to be here in conjunction with the library. Um, so thankful that they could host you all because you would not all fit in our shop. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also not the good microphone, so. so yeah, just okay. pretend it's not. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. So thank you all for coming. Um, tonight we're welcoming the New Yorker cartoonist and Vermont cartoonist laureate Ed Corin to Woodstock. I know it. that's exactly why you're all here. And in support of his new book, his newest collection, Corin in the Wild, released in late October by Button Street Press, the acclaimed New York cartoonist illustrates country life, ex ex urbanites and the ironies of living in the boonies. His cartoons have Vermonters looking at city folk and city folk looking at Vermonters. Corin's humor is humanoid and warm and is warm and fuzzy and puzzled and brave creatures will delight the reader, country dweller or not. In his latest collection of cartoons on country life, drawn from his porch in Vermont, nothing is sacred. Gas stations, vegetarians, parenting, animals, gourmands, country stores, all are examined with the unique perspective and creativity of this brilliant observer and artist in the world. Ed Corn has long been associated with the New Yorker magazine, where he has published over 1,100 cartoons, as well as numerous covers and illustrations. He has also contributed to many other publications, written and illustrated several books for children, and illustrated many more in various genres. Corin has deep roots in both New York City and Vermont, where he lives with his family and has been a member of the Brookfield Vermont Volunteer Fire Department for 30 years. In 2007, he received the Vermont Governor's Award for Excellence in the Arts and served a three-year term as Vermont's second cartoonist laureate. We're, we are the only state to have that kind of glory. So. <laughs> <laughs> New York and Vermont intertwine in Corin's life and work where he gleefully practices his exquisite talent for noticing. As he writes in his artist notes about his exhibition at Columbia University, I can never quite believe my luck in stumbling upon riveting mini-dramas taking place within earshot and eyeshot, a comedy of manners that seems inexhaustible. All kinds of wonderful moments of comedy happen right under my nose. The Yankee Bookshop, myself and Christian, are proud to support the Norm Norman Williams Public Library with book sales for this event. As many of you already experienced, thank you so much. A portion of tonight's proceeds do go to the library, um, as with every event that we help with here. So thank you for that. Um, also, I believe there's something somewhere to collect donations uh, for the library. It will be here soon. Uh -huh. <laughs> so if you enjoy tonight's entertainment, uh, please consider leaving a donation on your way out. Um, but yeah, and with, without any further ado, uh, Ed Juan. Can you hear me? Is this um, effective? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I apologize for being a little late, but our life got in the way of art, so uh, <clears throat> I had to respond to a fire department call that I couldn't say forget about. It. So here I am, a little late. Thank you for your patience, and thank you, as they always say to me, for your service. <laughs> so, at any rate, I want to. Uh, tonight's talk is is. Book talk, signing, um, is a, it's a bit of a hybrid, because if I were to read, uh, if I were a novelist or a poet, I would simply read to you. And uh, tonight I'm going to both read the captions, because I see the screen is quite small, and uh, the cartoon captions will be probably pretty illegible, and I hope uh, even the images can be seen from way back there. Uh, and if, if the situation is is not clear, I can describe it, but uh, in, in truth it should describe itself. At any rate, um, this is a bit of a hybrid because as my, as this art form is, it's, a, it's one of the most curious of art forms in the sense that um, novelists are, or poets are, or playwrights really are never asked where do you get your ideas. Uh, but this is a question that I get all the time. And rightly so, because it's a, it's a bit of a mystery, not only to those who read cartoons, but also to those of us who uh, 
we generate it. There are many of the time, many of the time I have no idea, so to speak, of where the, 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 the end result of the cartoon finally uh, comes together. So um, I encourage you to ask questions. This is more of a screen side chat than it is a lecture in any way. Uh, I want this to be a conversation, uh, as in fact cartoons are. Um, let me begin by, by trying to characterize cartoons, or <clears throat> the kind of New Yorker cartoon. Uh, this is one of many genre of satirical drawings that have <clears throat> been with us for many, many uh, centuries, and uh, starting with some of the people who were my inspiration. Uh, oftentimes I'm asked, what, what was your inspiration? And I keep thinking they're too numerous to elaborate. But some of them go back 200 years to the beginning of graphic satire. But um, I will just read this introduction that Dorothy Parker wrote to a, a, a collection of Thurber drawings, um, The Seal in the Bedroom, which was published <laughs> in 1932. I'm sure you all remember it. Uh, and, she, and what she writes is, is, is in, a, in a sense, characterizes all of the cartoons that, and graphic satirical works that um, I've come to know and come to really draw on, literally and figuratively, over my career. Uh, Thurber was one of my influences. And uh, so she writes about Thurber. She says, Thurber deals solely in culminations. Beneath his, his picture, he sets only the final lines. He gives you a glimpse of the startling present and lets you go construct the astonishing past. So that really characterizes what we all do, all the New Yorker cartoons that you will amass in your uh, experience over the years, and um, mine included. So it's a question of what, hap what, what was happening before this frozen moment ha occurs, and what will happen afterwards. It's a very interesting kind of uh, mo similarity between, say, Cartier-Bresson's notion of, the, of that, that moment. The, uh, I can't remember what he called it. I don't know if anybody does. It just it's escaped me. Um, that the, the, the seizing and the characterizing of a particular instant in time. And that, these follow the same pattern. So um, without further ado, I'm going to go through this. As a, it's a little bit like Robert Benchley, an early contributor to the New Yorker, great, one, of the, one of the originals in the, early, in the 20s when it first started, talked about looking at cartoons. He said it's very much like like eating salted nuts. The more you, you know, you, more you, you, you eat them, the more you want. So they go quickly. I mean, they're perceived in seconds, really. Uh, but the, the perception is the decisive moment. That's it. From uh, the, the Cartier-Bresson characterized his, his capturing of this really frozen instant. And that's what these are. They're frozen theater pieces, really as, in fact, is good photography is as well. So, that said, let's start. If you have questions, let me know. Uh, I'll be around and I'll take questions after, after the fact, um, after I finish. Uh, I hope not to go on too long and we can converse afterwards. So, let's begin. Um, now, <clears throat> No one can see this, so in the back. So I'll read this. This is, a, this is kind of, I begin with an autobiographical moment of uh, what it's like to be a cartoonist. And you know, all surrounding this, this uh, ink-stained wretch that I've drawn <laughs> at this, this, the, the, the drawing table, there are all these questions of people who are surrounding it. Says, what's so funny about that? <laughs> and then. I'm sorry, but I don't get it. Where do you get your ideas? And got a minute? Here's a great idea for a cartoon. How long does it take you, draw, take you to draw one? 
Hey, that's my husband and me. I love it. <laughs> so this is really a compendium of my life. Cartoonist. <laughs> Uh, men drinking coffee. <laughs> and it's, um, I don't know. Can you see? Can you see this way yeah. back there? Just it's, barely, a, barely. it's an older drawing. This this book um, that has come to be thanks to Margot Zalkin, standing back there, uh, was her inspired perception that I have spent my career kind of exploring this, this interface between rural and urban and exurban and, and uh, life. I mean, it's as if I'm a bit of an expat from New York, but living here, and it's, I'm, I'm feeling when I go to New York, I'm an expat when I go there. At any rate, it's uh, my observations of both sides of the, 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 the world we live in. So, going out of business. It's a pet shop, and uh, it's a very early drawing. It goes back to the 70s, um, and the, stylistically, it's a very different drawing than ones that we will see that are, that are more recent, and which is another aspect of this peculiar art form that depends on draftsmanship and on ob observable aspects of the, the world around, and how I managed to interpret it through drawing. And this was an early drawing, much less uh, given to contrast or you know, a, a sense of ease with my hand and pen. That's a very recent drawing. And, uh, and the caption is, our eggs are particularly awesome today. <laughs> and what, this is a finished, this is a, uh, Talk a little bit about process here. Um, let's go to the next one. That is a, the original submission to the New Yorker in pencil for the very same cartoon. As our eggs are particularly awesome today. This is how one works with the New Yorker. What I, how I work with, it, and everybody else who works for it. Um, pencil drawing, very quickly drawn. Uh, these days, I think uh, the younger cartoonists are using pads, uh, Wacom pads, or uh, you know, <clears throat> digital pads that they draw on and then um, send their work from there to the editors for, con for consideration. This is my, the old style. You do pencils, pencil drawings, send them into the magazine for a, uh, a Tuesday art meeting. Um, that's been going on since 1925, and another one was held today. And today I submitted about four or five ideas like this in pencil drawing. And like this was when it was submitted, and for men, many of my over 50 years of doing this, it's been the same waiting to see whether there was a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Uh, an acceptance, an appreciation, or a full-on uh, full rejection. And uh, so this has been my, my and my colleagues' lot for, for, for a very long, almost 90 years now. The magazine has been in, in, in existence. Yeah, Do you question? hope that they get, accept one of the five, or? Oh, or? yeah. I mean, I hope they accept anything. Uh, they, uh, might accept um, five. they may accept one, maybe two, maybe not, and it goes on like that each week, day, in, I mean weekend, week out, and the, and it can be dispiriting and it can be elating. So it's a, it's a, but you wait. It's you know it's like being in a waiting room and seeing what the doctor says when it comes out. <laughs> Do you find that um, does the New Yorker sometimes try and theme your things with their articles? Or no. Independence, which is yeah. why you're no. so Yeah, the question is did the New Yorker try to theme the articles, you know, and what the content is with the cartoons, and it's not. <coughs> not uh, the cartoons are accepted, the, fi the finish, the, the one that go back to the finish. So from there it goes to that, because I don't want to develop an idea. That's much more developed uh, in, in every way, in relationships and. In, in the uh, inter interpersonal um, uh, dynamics between the characters I like to draw. Um, 
and there's no point to do that if it's going to be rejected. So the this and to exaggerate, you know, to take some of the elements and make, exaggerate them, make them a little bit clearer. I mean, it's it's hard to know, but it's a process of that that, that is almost uh, without uh, predetermination. It just just happened. Like I decided those chickens had to be even bigger than the ones I drew, <laughs> and looming over them, the eggs more numerous. <laughs> and I had to give an homage to uh, some wonderful women I know who run a, a, an organic farm near where we live called the Green Mountain Girls. And there, on top of farm stand, it says Green Mountain Girls. Just as a tribute to them and what they, what, what they do. So um, that's the process that goes on. Another question, yeah. I was wondering if, if cartoonists still have idea men as they used to back in the 40s. Do cartoonists have idea men? Um, uh, gag writers, as they were also called. Uh, no, not as far as I know. Uh, I've never used any. Uh, I know there's there's some celebrated cartoonists who you, you think uh, or whose worlds are are specifically theirs. They like George Price, and you see a situation you say that's a George Price world. Mm -hmm. uh, his, he had only one idea that was published in the New Yorker, and it was a cover of uh, a, a subway car filled with Santa Clauses. Was, and that was his. But otherwise, ideas at those days were, were bought for him. And the ideas were bought for specific artists like Adams, and sometimes on and, and And oftentimes, it was a bit of a hybrid. Like Adams would think, also have his own ideas, but in uh, but it's not done much, not been done at all anymore. Um, yeah. Um, is your that pencil sketch that you submit is that the first time you've done that, or is this a an iteration of oh, previous? Uh, is the pencil sketch the first time I've done this? Um, yeah, it is. I mean, it's just very spontaneous, oh. and I I kind of doodle and diddle around and. Uh, and try to try to structure the uh, the situation. So I'll try different, very rough sketches, and end up with that one. But uh, but I don't work too hard at it. Yeah, <laughs> sir. Excuse me. What uh, what's the timing? You send in the pencil drawing. How long is it before you hear? What's the timing of uh, between between submission and uh, and judgment? Um, yeah. Find out about yeah. it. And it's a, it's a it's, well, let's say I submitted today, and I should find out uh, if anything caught fire, so to speak, um, on Friday. And then, when, then you have how long to actually do the Oh, after, if there's an acceptance of an idea, then I have leisure to do it, unless, unless it's an exceptionally um, current idea. And that's happened only a few times. Since what I do is generally more a comedy of manners than of politics, and some and the intersection is, is often the same, but it's not editorial cartoons as as the political cartoons might be. Yeah. Uh, do you have any like uh, like one cartoon that you thought for sure was going in yes. and that didn't get in and yeah. that, that sticks do, out of your mind? Do I have one cartoon that I thought yeah. was for sure going in and didn't? All of them. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I mean, I don't submit them unless I feel they're really on the mark. You know, they're, they're, they're funny, and they're, they compress something in our general life that is meaningful. So... Do you re resubmit them after, if, if they get rejected? Do, do I resubmit them? Well, oftentimes I'll look at them and I say, you know, maybe they were right, and um, I will rethink something that I think is a very good drawing in a wonderful situation, but I already think it either um, in terms of the, the theatrical parsing of it, you know, the theater direction, if, I, if you will, and the, and the, the writing, and the caption, and what's being said, and how that, uh, that's, that, I mean, it's, it's a bit, I mean, the, a, a good editor will say, well, this works, this doesn't work, but maybe it might work this way or that. And I, I oftentimes do that with myself. Uh, I go back and say, yeah, maybe this way, maybe that way. And sometimes um, I'm right. 
and it's, 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 a, it's a much better idea, and, and it's finally accepted. Yes? So the ones that are rejected, which you love like a child, presumably, what do you do with them? What do I do with the ones that are rejected? Um, there's a salon des refusés in my, <laughs> in my drawers. <laughs> I don't know what to do. There's no second, there's no other place there's no where you market them. No, I mean, that's another interesting aspect of what, what this kind of, what's called gag cartooning. It's, a, it's, it's not a very elegant way of looking at it, but uh, single panel cartooning might be a more acceptable way. Um, the, um, what was the, what was oh, you mean what, oh yes. Um, there used to be, in, when I first started cartooning, uh, as a profession back in 19, early 60s, late 50s, um, there are many, many publications that publish cartoons, and many of you might remember the Saturday Week Post, and Collier's, and Life, Look, um, Saturday Review. Um, all of them published cartoons, and there was an interesting, here's another process uh, reminiscence. Of, now, on Tuesdays, um, which is the day the New Yorker looks at cartoons, but in those days, um, all the cartoon editors uh, would look at cartoons brought in by cartoonists uh, that they had done that week. All these offerings, it's like a, it was like a farmer's market, but there were cartoonists. And they you know, instead of uh, the editors coming to various stalls and stands in the farmer's market, we'd go to them. And it was a, it was a kind of uh, ritual. You started the New Yorker because it was the most prestigious and the truth had paid better. Uh, and then you would go to, say, the Saturday Evening Post, which was next down on the ladder, and down and down and down. <laughs> or, I mean, this is a value judgment to be sure, but it was not un, un, not unrealistic to think of it this way. And so people, cartoonists then, made a living by publishing their work to all, with all these, uh, platforms, as you call it today, magazines. And there are none left save the New Yorker. They don't exist. No. Um, so that's how, what I have. Yeah? Do you ever put the refused ones on social media? Uh, do I put the refused ones on social media? No, because I'm an old guy and I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> and I frankly don't, you know, have the time to do it. I mean, I'm much more interested in going forward than figuring out what to do with these things. And I know a lot of my colleagues and now at the New Yorker, much younger colleagues, are doing just that. And it makes a lot of sense. <coughs> if why put them in a drawer if they can be appreciated and pleasure can be given, even though you're not making a, a cent out of it. Um, and I understand that, but um, it's not my way at this point. I'm you know, too, too old to, to figure this one out. <laughs> yes. Were you a doodler as a youngster? Was I a doodler as a youngster? Um, yeah, much to the despair of my teachers. Was, uh, you know, it started in grade school and continued on into college. So I look at my notes that I took in college and they just killed me. So I was uh, an inveterate uh, scrivener from that point up, even early. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, one more, and then we'll, we'll go on, and then more later. What is the process of choosing a cover? Because sometimes the covers are hilarious. Yeah, what's the process of choosing a cover? Uh, it's, it's a, a different, I don't, I'm not sure, uh, in the sense that it's a, there's a separate cartoon editor, a separate editors who do occupy themselves with cartoons, and another one with uh, covers, um, just one. And uh, a woman named Francoise Mouilly, and, uh, who was married, interestingly enough, to Art Spiegelman. Um, so uh, I'm not sure. You know, you can. I think what you your answer is really in looking at the covers and seeing what judgment is there. You know, it's never specific. It's never stated at all. So let's let's continue on a little bit more, and then we'll continue the conversation. 
Uh, so it's a smoking the cemetery, smoking, not smoking. And uh, this is this is somewhat akin to the uh, it resembles the Montpelier cemetery. And uh, I'm very interested in telling this a story in a way that it could be uh, the details make it easy to see. Uh, make it easy to understand, and also because I love drawing detail. I mean, I love drawing, but I also love drawing detail. And so the gravestones and the monuments and so on have a certain comic aspect to them as well, especially when they're all compressed that way. So that that is why I, it's a little um, uh, complex and somewhat somewhat maybe over detail, but I love doing it. Um, any impressionists in this crowd? I mean, this is this is sort of the interface between you know the cosmopolites and the and the ruralites in the uh, in, in a way. I mean, it's plein air painting, painting from from nature, and the the, uh, the, the patrons in their BMW sports car. <laughs> I mean, it had to be a BMW when I drew it. There's no other no other machine that would sort of state who these young people were, or not so young, and, and uh, so that's why it was that. I think this may be an appropriate moment to say a few words in memory of the animals we've slaughtered for our pleasure. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it in there, but every, every animal has been <laughs> sacrificed for pleasure, fish, and fowl, uh, and quadrupeds of all sorts. Um, and there's always somebody in the crowd who will say something like that. Uh, artisanal pottery, and down there, there's the guy who, the potter, he has a little sign saying, artisan. <laughs> your mother and I think it's time you got a place of your own. We'd like a little time alone before we die. <laughs> and uh, one of Tributes to my adopted state is, is the, guy, the sweatshirt on the on the uh, aging son who's at the University of Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> Divorce sale. Uh, this is as much a, a comment on, on gender specific objects as anything, as well as the schism between this couple. Um, but you know, it's a, I would look at that and I say, if, you, if I didn't have that, those expressions on those people and their body language that way, simply, you know, not have anybody in that, that, that the image, it wouldn't be anywhere near as funny. I mean, I, it's all very deep inside me, what works and doesn't. I'd like my daughter to know something about engines. <laughs> this was done a long time ago, but it's, it's, a, it's a kind of homage to my friend Leon Betts, who was my Saab mechanic for many, many, well, for decades, really, before Saab. Uh, my Saab rusted. Rust is now rusting in peace. Uh, and uh, he tended to many of them over the time. But, he was, but I love to shop. I love to wander around auto shops and to just take note of what the environment in which other people work. And I admire people who work with their hands, of all, all kinds of work. And in particular, uh, people who occupy themselves with automobiles. She looks like she's dying. <laughs> yeah, well, this, this is a stem of moment. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't thought of then, but now it is. She may find a career, you know, a damn good one, actually. God's wrath level high. <laughs> Another Vermont inspired idea. <laughs> it, it comes from the passing on my velocipede, often the local fire warden's um, house, and there's always the fire level that he posts there, so somehow I was despairing about human existence in that case. Aisle one, good for you, and aisle two is bad for you. And again, it 
has to have a human component there. I mean, it's uh, the, the self-satisfaction of the good for you aisle patrons and the furtiveness of those on the right who should really be on the, the one on the left, but they, you know, they hope none of their, their uh, compatriots under, observe them. Great for worship then, great for retail now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> church in a, in a kind of small Vermont town. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting to be reading, I don't know if, how many of you have read, read Seven Days, <clears throat> last week's uh, issue devoted to Vermont towns and the, and the future of rural life in Vermont and, and whether, whether we as a state will be able to support small towns as time goes on. It's a, it's a brilliant issue. Um, it's a wonderful I idea to bring together a uh, survey of towns all over Vermont. It's, it's not, not only in, in and around Burlington. And, it's, uh, and part of the worry and is the lack of patronage of churches and how churches are dying on the vine in small Vermont villages. Mm -hmm. as Indeed, the villages are themselves. So, it, this was this. I mean, this that was done way before this crisis ever ever came to be. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is the quiet trail. <laughs> um, personal experience is really my, the base of what I do in many respects, and uh, <clears throat> this comes from a, a moment that I experienced on the trail. The, in, at the Mansfield Touring Center up in Stowe, where I was skiing with a group of friends and some guy zoomed by us, talking very loudly on his cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> he was paying no attention to all the delights of the natural world you're supposed to or are open to you on Nordic skis. But <laughs> And I wanted to say that to him, but I, I didn't get that moment. And then finally, this is my saying it to him. I can never find it. How far is two pounds from here? Uh, this is also a bit of autobiographical. A simulcrum of, of our house. Um, I oftentimes, at the inn next door to us, hosted walking groups and uh, I always was amused by them and somehow put these this question in one of their mouths. I was never asked this but I thought I might do. I'm having my annual reunion with Polar Tech, Thinsulate, Fleece and my oldest friend Wool. <laughs> for the moment. The climactic mo climat climatic moment now. Look what we found yesterday when we were clearing out the attic. <laughs> uh, this, um, I like to draw porches. I love to draw porches because they are places of, of uh, sociability, particularly in the summer. And it's also where these interfaces between people who visit from elsewhere and people who live here, or at least have second homes here, they all interconnect. And, I love drawing, being a kind of social anthropologist, and so they, I dress these folks uh, appropriately. And the guests are clearly not from Vermont. And uh, the hosts, maybe not, maybe they're here for now and now and then. Um, but the wicker furniture, the hors d'oeuvres, the um, dress, um, how people Kind of body language, it's all kind of, kind of interests me. The next one is also a porch. So mm -hmm. Clark and Denise are our closest <laughs> neighbors. <laughs> and I did this somewhat later, but somehow I still was in, interested in the wine. And, you know, Clark and Denise, Clark is having a martini. The other one is the, the, the buck is having, I don't know what, an artisanal brew. Um, but it's just, and the guests, the guests are even more um, citified. I mean, 
<clears throat> the guy has a little paunch, he has a hat that nobody around here wears much. Um, he wears loafers without socks, oh. <laughs> and, and on and on, the scarf, also the wicker furniture, also the wine glasses. I mean, these are details that are part of storytelling that I like to eat. So I enjoy drawing them. So they may be over elaborate, but they're, they have a kind of resonance to them. Rufus, stop being naughty with Mrs. Curtis. <laughs> Slow ragamuffins and urchins, <laughs> which is what I saw often from my window um, during maybe some years ago when the local kids were waiting for the school bus, and they were like that. They were as raucous and engaged and as they are. You don't see kids much anymore waiting for school buses at all. So this is a historical document. I know I haven't been much of a master to you, but then again, you haven't been much of a pet to me. <laughs> like Dorothy Parker points out, you wonder what, they're gonna, what that dog is going to say. <laughs> what could he possibly say? <laughs> the weather looks a little iffy. <laughs> our, our lot here. This is not a conversation you need to join. <laughs> this is somewhat autobiographical. Namely the car, the one on the right. In that, <clears throat> I get very exercised by bad behavior on the road. <laughs> It's a perfect day to reorganize those closets. <laughs> this is not a gallery. <laughs> but these are the same same couple that asked about, you know, are there any impressionists in the crowd? Now they're looking for art. But the idea came to me walking around Chelsea in New York. The, uh, the, the art, the new, somewhat new now, art history. And it was, at the time, being populated by very fancy galleries and in a neighborhood of art, artisanal workshops and body shops and the people, companies that made sheet metal work. And one of such establishment next to a really glistening new art gallery uh, put, posted that on its door. Uh, this is not a gallery. <laughs> So I figured, I tried to figure out, what can I do with this? The reality was too, was not funny enough. And uh, so I, I brought it north to, to Vermont to my friend Floyd's store, Al Floyd and Jan. And I set it there. And uh, so, again, this detail, the, the BMW, the bag, the hat, the, the stiletto shoes, all these things you never see around here. Or if you did, you'd know precisely who these, this, this person was. And uh, all the guys on the porch, you know, all of them I know, uh, just appraising and bemusedly, wryly, this whole situation. And uh, lastly, when this appeared, and my friends, the Floyds, were, you know, bemused and pleased by it, and Jan, um, told me that, you know, sometimes people do come in and ask that. <laughs> it, was, it was a real general story. That is hot belly stove and everything you need. So, we're really bonding now, aren't we, Dad? <laughs> so a friend of mine was canoeing with his son, and his son said, said it, just that to him. And he, he said, you got to use this. And, and it, he and the son were canoeing on a flat water lake sometimes. <laughs> it wouldn't work. You know, the, the, it was not, not particularly funny. And uh, so I transposed it to something a little bit more extreme, <laughs> <for> class four. 
I guess, or five rapid. Well, there's your problem. <laughs> Again, the drawing is very very. I did that in the 1970s, early 70s, when I was just trying to figure out how to draw. Uh, not that I've gotten anywhere near knowing it exactly, but it's, it's closer. <laughs> Wonderful father, devoted husband, benevolent employer, generous citizen, but. <laughs> this, is, this is maybe maybe my favorite. Your father and I want to explain why we've decided to yeah. live apart. <laughs> So many elements. I don't want to describe them. <laughs> Even starting with the, with the phrase "live apart," which is really how it all started. Because I have heard someone say that. What the consequences will it have? And again, well, what were the moments leading up to this? And what were the moments? <laughs> And each of these mice, the, the kid mice, each of them has a different expression. Each one. I mean, it's hard to see from here, but I made a real point of having them individuated to such a degree. You can see by its smile that this halibut was humanely killed. <laughs> That's another phrase that was said to me once. I read it, actually, on a menu, and I said, what does that mean? <laughs> How does it what happened before? What, <laughs> what was the process? Um, whatever. I was when whatever was really uh, everyone said all the time. Whatever. You know, it's still in the, in the lingo. It's, uh, it's kind of faded from, from our general consciousness. Today's objective is the genetically modified corn in this quadrant. <laughs> I just wanted to get vengeance on some of the people. <laughs> Tell them how hard we've worked to protect their habitat. <laughs> Good intention. Good luck with your lecture, Eric. They're loaded for white mail. <laughs> that was done a while back, but I still think it has some legs. <laughs> and we'll continue. Yeah. You grab the food, I'll grab the wine. <laughs> you can see, I mean, the haplessness of these two, this couple, is, is something that I focused on. They have no clue. <laughs> Rufus here is the center of our life. <laughs> kind of says it all for pet ownership. <laughs> Paper or plastic? <laughs> When I, I wanted to get the details of a bank teller's station right, and so I went into the bank I we banked with, uh, and I started drawing, and uh, they got very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, and I, and finally somebody said, uh, "May I help you?" I said, well, I'm thinking of making a deposit in my account. <laughs> But by then I had gotten what I needed. So, okay. My parents decriminalized sugar. <laughs> that is more of an urban playground than one finds around here. <clears throat> now this is an archaeological site, and uh, all the details of the archaeological dig are there, with the assistance of the computer, and the photo. The documenting with photography, but he's re the archaeologist is reading this language, whatever it is. He says, mow lawn, take out garbage, <laughs> water plants, weed garden. <laughs> Just think, somewhere down there, 
someone is doing something inappropriate. <laughs> I've often thought that. <laughs> Why is he smiling? Why is he smiling? That's a good question. You can answer it as well as I. Um, but I, I think, I think, um, I really, I mean, I have my theories. But if he was door, what would that, would that be? Yeah. I mean, the fact that he takes delight in the, in the social norms of being... He yeah. says more about the artist. <laughs> <laughs> Could well be. But if, but if it was different, if he was sour or not pleased, the, the, the point would not be made. Yeah. Yeah. Um, these are a few covers that I've done um, of, of late. You know, again, the selfie and the, the, vis the visitors from... From the country, <laughs> uh, this one can see almost anywhere. <laughs> the, the rise of two-wheel delight. This, of course, was inspired by my neighbors and what I see as I wander around Vermont, which is the, you know, the, the parcelization of our state and the lack, you know, the kind of destruction of habitat, but also. The desire to keep things mowed. <laughs> Michael Pollan said something very funny about about the lawn, about mowing lawns. Um, oh God, do you remember that? Mm. Do you I, submit many cover ideas? I do now and then, um, in, in spurts here and there. Um, but I but I'm also fascinated by these riding lawnmowers. <clears throat> people, you know, instead of using them, you know, mowing by by walking, they'll they'll mow anything with wheels, <laughs> tiny as they are. I have some neighbors who have these minuscule yards, and they mow them by sitting on some giant creature that costs them thousands of dollars. Uh, not to mention the ones, who have, you know, hundred acre lawns and spend their entire retirement mowing. <laughs> so. And, well, I see that our time is just about up. <laughs> and in truth, with this, it is, but now for more questions. <laughs> Anybody, you know? Yes? So, what age were you when you created your first cartoon? What age was I when I first, well, probably about three, but at uh, <laughs> four. Uh, the, uh, first, I, when I was in high school, I started drawing. Uh, for the, the high school publications, you know, the, the football program that they had for games, and then the newspaper, and we had a new, uh, yearbook, and a few other things. So it started there, and then in college, I, it, it, then I really said, this is great. Because it was the only way I could express myself. I was a, um, Somewhat recessive kid with a. I didn't do sports. I tried, but I failed at it. Uh, one after the other, and uh, I finally found that this was a way of of giving pleasure to others, and it's never stopped. And you know, from high school on, and uh, after through college, I there was a humor magazine in the college I went to, and I, I became. Uh, I was very involved in it and grew for the four years that I was there. Yes, sir. Did you study art or did you just Did I study art? Um, I went to liberal arts college and uh, so I didn't study art. They were, in the 50s, art was not considered part of a uh, viable curriculum to focus on for, for liberal arts students or university students. Um, and so I I was allowed the one course for credit, and the, all the rest were uh, English, art history, philosophy, all the liberal arts. I mean, it was a time when you you could really explore a lot of the disciplines. <clears throat> but I focused mostly in English and art history, which, in fact, I mean, English and art history come with drawing and and uh, writing. So, uh, and I did 
because I was, uh, I became the editor of the Skewer magazine, and I also took a fancy to graphic design. I thought I'd go to graphic design school, which I did not. I put it off, went off to Paris after a lot of false starts working in city planning and uh, <clears throat> publishing. And I went to Paris and I studied etching and engraving. And after that, I came back, worked more in publishing, uh, decided that was not for me. Wanted to be an artist, wanted to be a cartoonist. I kept submitting all those years to New Yorker uh, without much success. Oh, we like your work, but someday we think maybe you'll do something that we will accept. But it took five, six, seven years of just plugging away at it. Meanwhile, I thought a day job was essential. So uh, I ended up going to Pratt, I got an MFA, I ended up teaching on the university level for many, many years, teaching art. Um, but the Pratt was really my most uh, disciplined art training. Yes? You mentioned that the New Yorker is the last publication that publishes single panel comics like this. Is the New Yorker the last publication? Well, you mentioned it's one of the last. Where it's do you one see of the last. It? Yeah. Where do you see this type of comic going in the future? Well, I think it's graphic, graphic novels and, and comics. It's uh, far, far more viable and vibrant, and certain kinds of illustration, uh, which use the same in, in kinds of intellect, visual and verbal intellect. I mean, some of the illustrations in the New Yorker for example, are superb. Mm -hmm. And the New York Times is using a, a group of young illustrators that are, that are as smart and sharp as any cartoonist because they really distill the, 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 the idea of the article itself. So it's, it's, a, it's the same, essentially the same uh, process of, of intellectualizing a, or, or, or analyzing an intellectual Content that is, say, an article in a, mag in a magazine, and then giving it a verbal, a, a visual uh, characterization. And some of it, so I would, I would say that that's where visual uh, uh, a avenues for younger people are there. You had another right question. Uh, so, can you describe the first time that one of your comics was, or cartoons, was accepted into the New Yorker? Like, how did you feel, and what preceded it? Uh, I wasn't depressed. <laughs> I mean, I, I never expected a cartoon. The first one I, I, I it was in 1962, April 62, so we're talking, what, 50, 57 years now. Um, and I was, needless to say, you know, I danced in the streets. Yeah. Um, what was the cartoon? The cartoon was, was very specific to the time. And if you saw it now, you would say, this is not funny. And it's, it has, it, it, you might think of it as uh, historic. But it was, it was at a time when, when um, it was just the beginning of the, the era when what people wore were emblazoned with legends and mm -hmm. phrases and words. But until then, sweatshirts had nothing on them, t-shirts, nothing. And in this case, it was, it was just beginning. And I depicted a writer at his typewriter then, with, surrounded by cigarette butts and paper overflowing a wastebasket. And he had, uh, he was looking very dejected, and he had on this sweatshirt Shakespeare. <laughs> his, his mentor. <laughs> I mean, that was, as you can see, it's not that funny at the moment. <laughs> but, but cartoons are very specific to time. And, um, and I consider myself lucky that some of these, which were done, I mean, like this was done in 1930 years ago, 40 years ago. It still has some resonance. But not, that doesn't happen all the time. And, that's, and, and what I'm describing is one of those times. It doesn't. So, yes. Yeah. Um, your cartoons are always instantly identifiable because of how your humans and your creatures look. Mm -hmm. How did you evolve that particular mm -hmm. way of portraying mm -hmm. humans and creatures? How, yeah, uh, how did I evolve the style of my, my 
work. Um, that's hard to say. I mean, it, it, uh, it's true that cartoonists, the, the cartoonists we love, all are identifiable. And, and they kind of give a, a world, the, the world, an identification. Like, that's a George Price person, or it's a Thurber situation, or Adams. Um, and, or Ross Chest more recently. You know, you can see people who are Ross Chest people. And th they also have a style that's absolutely unique to them. Um, and uh, this is what, for me, it's always, it's never been a goal, it just kind of happened. And I uh, stopped drawing in the style that I first started with, the, the drawing that you brought up, the first one. Um, because it seemed very similar and, and uh, to all the, the, the kind of style that New Yorker cartoons seem to gravitate towards. A lot of wash drawing, and some charcoal, and I gravitated to line, line drawing, which, which, you know, without wash, without tone. Um, and, but then it happened. I think, you know, it's going to... Uh, it's just impossible to tell you. I haven't worked for a, for a uh, to achieve a certain visual style. It just over the years it developed, trend, more, transformed itself without will. Yes. I just wanted to make a comment because one of the things that arrests me about your work is that everything you draw looks alive, uh -huh. including the furniture. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I have a lot of Thank you. That's sort of what I, that's what I really wanted to achieve. And, that, and what I'm really interested in is a lot of, I mean, cartooning for me is, is a mixture of social anthropology, sociology, and psychology. I mean, what the, the interplay of human, humans, one another, the look, the eyes, the body language. I mean, it's all, it's all, it's a piece of theater. And uh, I'm the theater director, and I also am the scene <coughs> designer, I'm the lighting designer, and I'm the dramaturg. I kind of pull it all together uh, and set the stage. You know, where should these people be sitting? Should they be over here or over there? And what dynamics go on between and among them? So that's part of the liveliness, I guess. So thank you. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, hi. We, we have a particular cartoon that we really like. Um, it's, how does one get a, like a, a print? Uh, who publishes that more? Who publishes the prints of cartoons? Well, for a while, it was the uh, Cartoon Bank, the New Yorker. And then the New Yorker uh, was, and still does, sell prints of cartoons. But I mean, they're what they are, digital, kind of digital. Uh, so we contact them. We contact them. them. <clears throat> and now there's a, um, what's it called? There's a whole new operation. Cartoon collection. Yeah. I think if you went there, you'd do better. Uh, I think maybe the quality of their prints would, would be somewhat <clears throat> more refined. Do you get royalties? Oh, uh, God. <laughs> Do I get royalties? I get a, a, I get a, you know, a few shekels. <laughs> Not a lot. No. Sir, uh, you have two images that come to mind that just purely technical fun as well as the other things, which you must have enjoyed. They hit the, uh, the one with the dog in the boat. Oh yeah. And the way occasionally where it works just right, where just because of the placement in space, all you have is like four or five parallel lines in the right spot, and everyone knows that's a door. Just for the line. So long. Well, thank you. You're obviously a man, well, but man of the arts. There. But to notice that, it's, um, so you, it must give you a feeling of minimal. Beautiful efficiency. Well, it, only after the fact. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, it's uh, the question, it's the observation, really, the delight I took in certain aspects of drawings, and it's uh, and it's not as if you set it's out to do it. I mean, it's almost, you know, it's, it's um, you wonder 
how inspired your hand can possibly be without your being present for it. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of great. Uh, but that's a, a part of the process. The, the more c conscious of, of that, the worse it gets. The dead, more deadly a drawing can be. So, um, here's a question. Ah, this is a very stupid question. Now you're, now you're um, setting them into New York on Tuesdays. So do you take a photo with your iPhone and just text it to the guy in charge? Or no, no. What I, do you uh, scan it? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to I scan it now because that's, they don't want anything else. Right. In fact, they don't want original drawings anymore. They want them scanned. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting process. Uh, I used to, as far as the originals are concerned, I, there were many different ways of getting them from my uh, Vermont rural hideaway to, to New York. And, and the most interesting one for me was taking it to the railroad station in Montpelier. And there was a night train with a baggage car and a baggage express. And I would, go and say hello to Bill Brigham, who's the station master, and give him a, and he would put, you know, process this big package filled with a couple of finished drawings, because they're big, they're not small. And uh, it would be put on, I would wait with him and kind of shoot the fat, because I like them. And a wonderful railroad buff who happened to be working for the railroad. And uh, I would wait for the train to come because it was always so dramatic. You know, we would come into Montpelier over a trestle bridge with this giant headlight and the horn blasting away. <laughs> and the baggage car would pull up to the station and Bill would take the, this, my work and give it to the, you know, the, the, the guy in the baggage car. And it would be off on the overnight train to New York and it would be picked up later in the day. Uh, when uh, in the morning when it, was, uh, when it arrived there. Now, and then it became Federal Express, uh, and now they don't want originals anymore because they don't know what to do with them. They're befuddled by drawings. <laughs> they don't have a place to keep them, so I just scan them from, from a big scanner in the copy shop. And the original, what I would submit, was also the same process. I'd mail them in a couple of days before, or I put them on the train, mm -hmm. one way or the other. So, but now it's all scanned, it's much easier in a lot of ways. So, so, oh, one more, yeah. So in the train days, how would you find out if your, if your submission was accepted? Do you get a telegram? <laughs> <laughs> Western Union messenger <laughs> or a horse. No, the phones were... <laughs> <laughs> it barely come into Vermont. <laughs> so, if there are no more questions, let us call it a night. <laughs>